Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, fields are being prepped for the 2021 crop. A look at what's next for the commodity markets as acreage estimates become a reality. It's panel time with Don Rose, Naomi Bloom, Ted Seifert, and Matthew Bennett. Next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, April 9 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Big round numbers usually grab headlines. Sometimes the smaller ones get attention as well. Case in point, last week's USDA acreage and quarterly stocks report. This week, another government report and some perspective. 2020 may only be the warm-up act for what's ahead in 2021. We've brought our panel of analysts together for their assessment on what's next. Before, though, we open up our discussion, let's take a look at the commodity markets. For the week, May wheat jumped 28 cents, while the nearby corn contract added 18 cents. The soybean complex is looking for a story to break out of the range trade. Many, or May soybeans gained a penny. May meal lost $9. May cotton expanded by 4.45 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, May class three milk futures widened by a dollar one. A green week in the livestock sector. June cattle expanded three cents, May feeders put on 40 cents, and the June lean hog contract increased 262. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index declined 78 ticks, May crude oil shed $1.96 per barrel, COMEX gold improved 1520 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs commodity index lost more than two points to finish at 471.80. Let's introduce our panel here to provide insight are Don Rose, president and founder of U.S. Commodities. Naomi Bloom, she is the senior market advisor for Total Farm Marketing. Ted Seifert, chief market strategist at Zaner Ag Hedge. And Matthew Bennett, co-founder of agmarket.net. Good to see all four of you in person. We did this back to start the year, half in, half out. So good to see you both. Good to see you both, Ted. Frequent drive miles, good to see you again. <laughs> uh, Naomi, let's start with today's report. Um, you had a simple headline for it. Why don't you lay it out for us? Yeah, the report was definitely bullish for corn. We had a big drop on those ending stocks. And then it was neutral for soybeans, coming in line with expectations with ending stocks staying unchanged at 120 million bushels. In a sense, it's a way that the USDA can kick the can down the road a little bit more. I think the ending stocks are tighter than what they're saying. But they did raise the export number on this report, so that was good because they needed to do that. The demand has just been so strong. And what I loved about the corn report was that they were able to increase demand for every category, feed, ethanol, and exports. So that really paints a rosy picture for corn prices going forward with 150 million bushel cut on the carryout. So Ted, a couple of weeks ago, you had laid out a scenario of what could happen and what this report might mean. Did any of your, what you had thought get confirmed today? I'm going to disagree with Naomi. I don't think what we saw today was bullish, really. It was, the corn number was friendly, but it was expected, right? And it's been expected for the last four months. So finally seeing that on paper and you see the reaction to the market, it wasn't bullish. It wasn't the spark that we needed to continue the strength that we had seen earlier in the week. In fact, we ended up giving back some of that in old crop. But for soybeans, I saw a problem there. This was the USDA drawing a line in the sand at 120 million bushels saying that's as low as we're going to go unless we see something extraordinary to make us increase another category. But they made a lot of changes on their balance sheet. Yes, the carryover stayed the same, but they changed crush. They lowered it by 10 million bushels. They increased exports by 30 million bushels. They increased seed by two and they lowered the residual all to give you the same number. They did a lot of jockeying in order to keep that 120 million bushel. And now that, that exports are 30 million bushels higher, and we just saw last week that number came down, 
and could continue to come down if we see more cancellations, it's really hard to say that we're going to run out of soybeans between now and the end of the marketing year. So the price rationing job in soybeans probably has been done. I think we've come to a time frame where we could probably see a step back in soybeans. I do think markets could get spicy again as we get into the summer months because next year's situation, as you said in the open, could actually be better. And the old crop soybeans at some point are going to have a job to do, which is carry as many beans into next year as possible. But the USDA is saying we're not going to run out of beans. Matt, do you see a line in the sand or fireworks ahead? I see a line in the sand, and I think that as soon as you get the April report printed, the first thing you do is you take carryouts and you look at the acreage that we got just a week ago, and you start put, filling in your supply and demand table. And so to agree with Ted, I think that you've got such a tight situation that moving forward, yeah, you could see major fireworks. Whenever you look at corn, for instance, if you take, you've got 1352 right now, that's your carry-in, you have to use 91.1 in May. You need about 180 bushel yield to stay at 1.352. That's if you don't drop your carry out even more. And I do think there could be a further reduction as far as the corn carry out goes. How much remains to be seen. As far as soybeans are concerned, yeah, you stay at 120, but whenever you use 87.6, it just does not work. And so you're gonna have to buy some acres. Uh, are they there to buy? Uh, there's a few, but probably not as many as what everyone uh, seems to think that there is. All right, Don, I saw the, the two head bobs uh, agreeing with Matt. Where's, where are you at on that? Well, I think when you look at these markets, you know, there's very little margin of error on corn or soybeans. I think we, that's pretty well a known fact. But this report was really, I think when you look at the U.S. situation, these whole markets have been about what is going on in the world the whole time. You know, Chinese buying everything else. And this report to me was more about the world market. You took the uh, soybeans up in Brazil. You took the uh, carry out in the world up like 113 million. Uh, even more than that, your biggest buyer, uh, China, you took the crush down 2 million metric tons, that's a lot. So that tells you you're backing up meal there. And at the same time, you left the uh, imports on corn and soybeans unchanged. And when you look at the corn, um, it's unimaginable almost you would think that it's gonna stay there, but we've got 600 million bushels of corn to export yet. And I think what the government's saying is we're not going to export all that corn. Uh, China's not going to take all the corn. So I think it's one that we're on a pause level right now, Paul. All right. Well, <clears throat> regarding the corn export, here's my thought with that is that, uh, so on paper, prior to today's USDA report, we had sold pretty much 100% of USDA expectations and export inspections. So what's actually left the country has been half of that. So we've been able to get over a billion bushels out of this country in the first seven months of the marketing year. And we got rid of two billion bushels of soybeans at the same time. So we have, I think physically and travel capacity wise, the ability to make sure that the rest of that corn gets moving out of the country. And I, I think we can get it done in the next five months, but it's definitely something the market's watching. I know it's a hot topic. I, I respect that, but the contacts at ADM think that it's gonna be able to get done, but I, I think we can do her. Yeah, but uh, Naomi, maybe it's, <clears throat> maybe it's not a capacity problem. We don't seem to have a capacity issue. We can get these exports out. But when you have China, when, when you have all these exports backing up, old crop exports backing up to China, it makes you wonder why that's happening. Is it China saying, hey, we're not ready for those yet? Don't send that yet. And they're dealing with a lot of soybeans, not from us anymore, but really from Brazil. But if they don't have the urgency for the corn, it makes you really wonder, okay, is that going to happen this marketing year? Because you've got, what, 14 million metric tons still yet to ship to China, and then let's call it another million and a half that comes out of the unknown category. That's very likely China. Is that going to happen between now and the end of the marketing year? And I, I don't think it's, it's, it's not a capacity issue. It's a urgency issue. China doesn't have the urgency. So I think very likely a good portion of that is going to get rolled in next year. Personally, I think the, the, the final ending stock number that we see for corn is going to be much higher than a 1.3. It's probably going to be 1.5 or 1.6. But the demand will still be there, it'll just be for next year. So, Matt, there's uh, a theory right now out there um, that we're trading four things. We're trading the weather, demand, crop conditions, and the USDA. It sounds, from what I've just heard, 
That seems accurate. Is there a fifth out there right now that we're not talking about that we need to in this discussion? Okay, whenever I whenever I look at this corn market, I mean, whether you, you talk U.S., you got to talk uh, Brazil as well. Whenever you look at southern Brazil, I mean, they're dry. I mean, it, this market is probably partially supported at this time by the fact that Brazil has some dryness issues. Whenever we're trying to go to the field, there's several folks that are rolling in the Midwest, and, I, and it looks like we could have a decent spring for early planting. Now, I know the weather's not a deal. It's not perfect, but at the same time, we're dry enough, and whenever you have a dry spring, typically acreage goes up. And so I've got to think we could pick up a little bit of acreage, but we have to keep a close eye on this safrina crop because, in my opinion, if the safrina crop does not turn out to be a big one, as was suggested with 108 million metric tons, I mean, I think it's premature to call it that, uh, but if, if we don't come up with anything close to that, I think that you're looking for major support in this corn market on moving on forward. Well, to, oh, go ahead, Don. Well, and I was just going to say, you know, the one thing I think what Matt's alluding to is these markets are all about risk premium in the market for all these things that we don't know about that could go wrong and it's possible and that's why we're up here but they also could go the other way too and so you have to be very careful when you're looking at that you know because remember we always take the stairs up the elevator down so at some point in time you run out of this premium and typically when you hit the spring is when if you get the crop plan it looks like you are you take some of the risk out so I think that's partly what the market's about right here. All right, so Ted, go ahead. I'm gonna. I, I need to get into a weather story to lead you okay. further down the discussion here, Ted. Uh, Boyce in Montpelier, North Dakota, where we know it's dry in in the state, with the drought in the north and soybeans presumably stealing acres from wheat, could spring wheat surprise us and end up being the big market story this summer? Hey, Boyce. Uh, yes. Uh well, there could be a lot of big market stories this summer, potentially. But yeah, uh, you know, spring wheat, uh, talking to my guys in the Dakotas, uh, they're having a really hard time getting planted. It's so dry, cold, windy, we're going from super hot to super cold. It's not been good. So, you know, if that spring wheat doesn't get in in a timely fashion, like really pretty soon, there's going to be thoughts of moving that over to row crops. And I think you are going to see about a million acres shift, or maybe not that much, but a significant amount of acres shift over to row crops. So yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of wheat in the world. There's a lot of, uh, you know, the, the winter wheat, I don't, you don't really have a tight situation there, but spring wheat could lead, lead the whole wheat complex higher. And I really like the chart of the spring wheat right now. I think there's quite a bit more upside unless there's a very dramatic change in the weather pattern in short order. Well, Kansas City, uh, the July futures opened nearly a gap higher earlier this week. Uh, you had Kansas City set, uh, I believe a contract high. So Matt, is this, is there one of these contracts that's going to be a brighter star or duller performer? Well, I mean, it's in my opinion, it's about got to be spring wheat. I mean, are you going to be led by winter wheat? Whenever we just found out last week, we had 2.6 million more acres than maybe what we thought we were going to have. I mean, and, and so I've got to think that it's got to be spring wheat. And then, so this isn't usually the time of year, though, where the wheat market is leading the pack. And so it, it spells good things for me as a grand in, in the grand scheme of things. I mean, I, are we going to see a, a support from the wheat market for both corn and beans? I don't know that you would uh, get a ton of support, but if the wheat market's rallying strong. As far as spring wheat is concerned, absolutely. I think that it's a good thing for everything. A rising tide lifts all boats. Naomi, do you um, think, I mean, the livestock side of this equation, is that playing into this at all about a feed issue that corn got so expensive that wheat has now come to the day? We had been talking about that for a couple months, that that possibility would be coming down the road. So wheat has a lot of different moving parts to it right now. The USDA on the report today actually said that we would maybe not be using as much wheat as is for feed this coming year. Um, back to the spring wheat, the last time we were together in January, I said that's the market that's going to be the one to watch. And I was bullish about it back then because of all of these moving parts that are starting to come into play. Spring wheat, definitely the leader. I think what you're going to see is traders doing spreads between buying the spring wheat, selling the Chicago wheat as a, as a way to get long the wheat. So th the wheat is still the follower in the grains, but the spring wheat has the ability to become the leader of the pack. Okay, Don, am I using wheat, if I'm a corn farmer with, maybe I'm one of them that still has grain in the bin, am I paying attention closer to the old crop price of corn right now? Am I paying a little closer attention to wheat on signals on when I should sell? Well, it's the wrong time of the year to be bullish on wheat. Now, maybe spring wheat because of a dry drought condition in the south or in the north, that's possible. 
But the corn market, I think you really have to watch these markets. Uh, the basis usually tells the truth. And the basis is pretty tight, you know, right now staying tight in spread. So I would watch those two signals uh, as your real key. And by the way, we did have a key reversal in May corn today. Um, and we do have a, a big premium May over the July. So when you look at moving out to the next month, you're moving to a discount. So is this going to be the tightest point that we have between now and the 1st of May? You know, we had a reversal last week as well, though, after the uh, planning intentions. And so I agree with you. Anytime you see a reversal in the market, you've got to pay close attention. But then we picked up quite a bit of ground on, on corn again this week. And so, you know, I, the, I agree with Don. You've got to watch the basis. You've got to watch the spreads. And there's no question that some originators in all over the country, actually, are very nervous. Uh, you, you hear about not only really good basis levels, but paying overs uh, over the posted bid. And so there's no question in my mind that corn is going to be pretty good ownership for the time being. But as a producer, you got to ask yourself, whenever you're $2 plus over last fall's price, do you want to be bullish? You know, at what point does greed take hold of you? you got to be careful to get too greedy here. You also had a reversal in that May, July corn spread today, too. So. Look, a reversal doesn't necessarily mean a high, but when you start seeing a series of reversal, these are all red flags that, hey, we might be coming to a near-term top for now. And the volatility that we saw this week, uh, at the end of last week and, and this, this week, that's also sort of indicative of, of the possibility of a near-term high. So guys need to be looking at that really very closely. It's also the right time of year for me with a good-looking planting forecast to say, okay, we can take a step back here. And personally, I'd love to see that because that would open a whole lot of reownership opportunities for me. Yeah, and then how about also with the May conversation that we're having, May and July, the fact that maybe funds are going to start to exit out of any long May and start rolling into the July because we're getting closer to first notice day too. So it may not be just indicative of a a bigger bigger correction just like you were saying but there's just a lot of little simpler moving parts underneath as well and loving how the basis throughout the midwest continues to get strong and stronger we had two adm plants reopening for ethanol this week i mean in the middle of this high prices that they're reopening these ethanol plants i think that's really says something about their optimism going forward so that's exciting to see. I was going to ask you a December question, but in, instead I'll ask you this. I'll ask kind of the same thing I did to Don. Would you be sell, how much longer are you holding old crop corn right now? Oh, just trickling it along and You're making sales. You're still holding some, but no, making keep keep making sales okay. as every time this market is is making making moves. Are you anxious, either any of you, to to pull trigger on December right now? I've been I've been suggesting thirty to fifty percent on December. Again, if we get a bigger correction, you look for reownership reownership strategies. As, you were, as Don was saying earlier, there's a lot of risk and there's a lot of uh, risk premium that's been built into the market. There's also a lot of risk that things change, demand destruction, things like that, that could make the market go down. And I, I think you need to be managing that risk by making these sales. I'd love to see guys close to 50% sold on new crop corn at this point. Well, and I think you have to remember just a year ago, the market was on its knees. And so if you don't think things can change and change fast, they can. I mean, so when you're at price risk management levels that make sense, you should at least be uh, looking at some percentage of sales. Well, Matt, the soybean market, one of those that was at our knees a year ago, uh, even six months ago, was a struggling one. It is in the shadow of everything right now. Ted kind of alluded a little bit that he sees a story coming. Do you see a story coming, a, a, a bullish picture coming? I mean, we've been stuck near $14 for about three weeks now. Yeah, we've just been kind of uh, flailing, flailing along here, not really doing a whole lot. Uh, just uh, in my opinion, though, on beans, whenever you look at how tight the situation is, it's hard to get super bearish. But at the same time, as a producer, you run the numbers it's on cash beans. I mean, how do you get bullish at $14? Now, I'm not saying as a trader that you can't. Uh, but you know what? As a producer, if I'm looking at new crop corn or new crop soybean prices, you know, whispering on $13 here lately, and I mean we're above $12.50. Uh, I'll tell you what: you can buy a put a floor under the market, uh, significantly above any sales that you've made for quite some time, and let the upside run if you want to. Uh, but I kind of like selling a few beans, and you know what? Buy a short dated call if you want. But I want to stay flexible because I think you could see major fireworks this summer with any hint of a weather issue. Uh oh, fireworks. Well, Did you just get excited? The, yeah. You know, we need at least 90 million acres of soybeans to plant it, if not more, like you were if saying we earlier in the show. So we're not going to know that data until the end of June, of course, but that keeps the market overall supported between now and the end of June. And so it's just really exciting for producers. But you're right, you know, don't lose sight of the value in front of you because it's amazing value. 
but there is potential for upside if the stars continue it, to align. In November, soybeans, you're talking from a producer level, are trading about 40 cents higher than July 22. So from a producer, are you going to carry beans for eight months and lose 40 cents? I don't That's think so. Point. So when you hit the fall time frame, there's going to be a merchandising challenge for a lot of people. Paul, I've been saying since the beginning of the year, and we've been doing this, that uh, November beans are the most undervalued contract on the board, on the grains board. I still think that's the case. You know, you look at what's happening for next year. If we don't get 90 million acres, which, man, it'd be unprecedented to go from an 87 to 90. If we don't get 90 million acres, if we don't have a 52 or 53 national average yield, given the demand outlook, it looks like we're going to be wildly negative soybeans uh, on our balance sheet for next year. Now, not saying that demand is necessarily going to be there. I would really like to see some new crop uh, soybean export sales on the books. We're off, we were off to a good start, but then we really flattened out. We saw a little bit last week. I'd like to see more. But if we don't have a reason to think that, dem that demand's going to get destroyed, we are, we are really set up for a very interesting scenario for new crop beans. I think I, I agree. And I, here's the thing I'll say. Whenever you look, uh, it's going to be hard to get those acres, first of all. Second of all, though, if you look at the, at the yields p uh, possible, where the beans are being planted are actually in high-yielding states, if you look at the planting intentions. And so there is a possibility that we could look at a very large national yield. But at the same time, uh, on the record, I'll tell you what, I think that these corn and November beans are, are actually uh, something that both could rally just a little bit based upon this acreage situation. We have to get more acres if we're going to make both balance sheets look really good. Naomi, mean, I got to have you answer this question: Is is this uh, are beans losing acres to cotton because of cotton's performance over the last three months, six months? Well, cotton's saying, "Don't forget about me." That's what cotton is saying. We had that brilliant rally, that four or five month rally, and then a setback recently. Today's report was supported. They increased the the exports for cotton, which they should have because sales were at 104 percent. So they needed to reflect that on the report today. So with cotton prices showing a little excitement, uh, we hit a recent low, starting to build back higher. Yeah, it's definitely saying don't forget about me. So cotton is back in this conversation. I think we still have the uh, spring wheat in the conversation along with uh, the other markets. So it is an exciting time for agriculture, that's for sure. All right, well, Don, there's a saying about the cattle market right now. Um, there's, there's optimism that beef demand is phenomenal, but the question is, where will reality and optimism meet in the cattle market? Well, what's happened right now is you've got a, a grain premium you're kicking in. I mean, look at next year's April cattle got up to like 133. But, you know, really it's about the demand market. I mean, the demand is so strong. Uh, that's what's really pushing us to the upside. Packer margins are huge, $600 ahead. But, you know, where are we going to go from here? Seasonally, we usually start to top out right now. So are we going to do a normal seasonal? Today, the government put out uh, uh, projections. They're like 120 for the for the fourth quarter. And for the summer, they're like 115 to 117. So we got a lot of premium in the market, but it's a grain premium. And you actually need it on the uh, meat market at the present time. Well, Matt, and the, the feeder, we talked about it a little bit about trying to figure out is there something else you feed with. But if you're a backgrounder right now feeding cattle, are you worried? <laughs> I'd, I'd say I'd be a little bit worried. The thing is, if you buy feeders right now and then you look at feed and then you look at fats on out to the fourth quarter into February, it's pretty thin. And so you got to be cautious. I mean, is the, what's the cattle producer going to do? He's going to step out on a limb and go out on faith, and that's something that they've always done. you got to be really cautious, though. And I don't want to uh, go out here and just hedge cattle and not do anything about my feed costs because, uh, quite frankly, if this summer doesn't turn out to be a good weather pattern, your feed costs could soar through the roof. So you got to be really cautious there. Ted, a, a hog uh, came to shore in Taiwan this week, tested positive for African swine fever, thought to have come from China. What's that doing to the world hog market? Is it impacting the global or the, the U.S. market more? The U.S. market is hoping that we're going to see a fair amount of exports uh, to Southeast Asia, China in particular, late spring, summer months. I mean, you look at where August hogs are trading, it's really pretty impressive. Exports have been pretty good even without China. China was, was, was on but barely on, didn't make a big splash on this last week's export sales report, but it was still a really solid number. Domestic demand's really good. Cut-up value's on fire. There's reason why hogs continue to make new contract highs. It's a really good looking chart. I think there's more upside potential for the hogs. Is there, Don? Well, I tell you, I look at it a little bit different. China, it, it's the U.S. market's going up, the rest of the world's going down. Um, China's, uh, their hog prices are under our prices. They're down 37% since a year. We're down 10% this week on hogs. 
Our exports were poor, down 10% over a year ago in February, so I'd be pretty leery of the hog market. You know, it's solid now on disease and demand, but uh, keep an eye on it. Naomi, is the dairy market solid right now? It is a really nice time in the dairy markets. Prices have been on an upswing um, in part because the global dairy trade auction has been higher nine out of the last 10 sessions. Our actual cheese prices are lower than global prices right now, so that's strong. Whey prices are improving. They're at the highest level since 2014. And with grain prices improving, that's also lifting the milk prices. So we've got front month milk contracts, mid $19 level, which in and of itself, without that extra farm to family food program, we're seeing this marketplace do its own thing. Production levels are up, but starting to decline. And so going forward, depending on you know how the feed situation is this summer, we might see more production declines if the quality isn't there. I know that where I live in Wisconsin, we are, um, it's going to be tricky sourcing soybeans, so it is a friendly market for, for the dairies. That's Naomi Bloom. Thank you so very much, Naomi. Ted Seifert's here. Don Rose is here. Matthew Bennett, thank you all. Time flies. We're having fun, but we're just mm -hmm. getting started. That'll do it for the TV side. We're going to do a web thing called Market Plus here in just a moment, so join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. Now, a reminder, it is spring field work season, duh, but that doesn't mean that you have an excuse for missing our weekly analysis, the Market Plus or the MTOM podcast. All are able to go where you go. Subscribe to all three and take us along for the ride. Remember, we do like cab time as well. Next week, we take a look at new weapons that are helping pollinators in the fight against colony collapse disorder. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.